Um, this is uh, now conversation number 17 of season two uh, of Unrehearsed Futures. And we continue to sort of try and understand um, where our future lies and our, our, our way forward. And Kamili has been coming into a lot of these conversations. I've also had some conversations behind the scenes with him. Abhishek and I have, uh, I don't know, come up, come up in theater around the same time in India. Uh, I think that whilst I went into pedagogy and I'm trying to do something there, Abhishek has um, just done some phenomenal work uh, over the last, uh, over the same period of time that leaves me awestruck. Um, beautiful article about him in uh, an Indian magazine called Caravan recently, which Falguni will paste a link to in case you're interested. Um, and I'm going to really start with uh, the blurb question um, that is the sort of conversation here. But it's a conversation which is what kind of theatre writing is expected of us, uh, the writers, the theatre makers, now beyond the pandemic, has the pandemic provoked us to think in new directions? Uh, what social responsibilities do, write, do writers bear? And in what ways can an imaginative approach to writing for the stage transform for issues like social change, for example? And that kind of is the official sort of thrust area. Um, and uh, we'll just start there. Just to let you know the format of the conversation, because we've discovered over the last couple of uh, unrehearsed futures conversations is that uh, some people are comfortable speaking on the record uh, whilst it's being recorded, but as soon as we start the after party, usually a lot of people, more people come off mic. Um, don't imagine this as two people on a stage and a bunch of us in the audience. Imagine it as everyone has come into a room and there's a, the setup is a circle of chairs and we're all sitting there together. And Kamali, Abhishek and I are sitting together on one side of the circle to just start off things. Um, but please do... Um, Feel free to put your comments, your provocations, your thoughts in the chat window to start with, and I'll ask you all to come off mic. Uh, somewhere around the forty-five minute, uh, somewhere around the forty-five minute mark, we will go. So we're going from recorded moderated to unrecorded uh, moderated, and then at the one hour fifteen mark, we will officially wrap up. But of course, feel free to hang out for the water cooler chat that happens afterwards. Um, most of you are known to each other. Um, please do, if you can, stay on camera so we can see you. So Abhishek and Kamili also have a feeling of who they're talking to. It would be lovely. Um, and otherwise, do listen in. And uh, also, I just put my name in a particular format. You can look at it, Jehan M. Mumbai. Uh, and you'll see that it's a, a, a good way to just sort of sense, a, sense the plural, plurality of the space that we're in currently. Uh, one of the themes of this season, possibility, planetarity, plurality. So without uh, further ado, uh, Kamili, a few words about yourself and then um, your thoughts and Abhishek, a few words about yourself and then your uh, opening thoughts. Sure, sure, sure. Um, thank you well, for joining you. us. Yeah, thank you guys for inviting me. Thank you, Jehan, for uh, setting this up. I've been sort of semi-badgering you for the last month, I guess, or so <laughs> about this particular topic, I guess. Um, I think Amy had brought it up to me originally because she and I have been having some kind of deeper conversations both in and out of uh, UF. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we started talking about bringing Abhishek in on the conversation. Abhishek I've known for, uh, oh God, we met in what, the 2007, 2008. And I've known him for a lot of years, but I hadn't spoken to him in probably 10 or 12. Um, so it was really interesting catching up to him. But Abhishek's been very prolific as a writer. Uh, since I've known him, actually, and I remember him talking to me, he was one of the first people who came up to me uh, in our pre lispa party. We both went to Lispa together, and uh, he was very, uh, he was very uh, curious about some things about writing. And I was like, "Oh, who is this guy?" And and we we started to kind of have a, a more interesting conversation about because we were both kind of fish out of water, right? I was this black American in this kind of uh british environment that was very multicultural at least from a, a a certain perspective but we're all kind of middle class aspiring in some way and then abhishek uh was very he was very adaptable but you know uh, you got the impression he could speak multiple languages and he had been in different environments before and he was he was very 
he didn't have a problem with space. I remember us Black Americans were very big on get back, get back, stay away from me. I need my space. And I remember thinking, boy, Abhishek is so adaptable. He could live right in. I mean, he was he was very good in parties and things too. So uh, I don't know if that's a good introduction for Abhishek since he's done so many things, but you can read his bio later. I just wanted to make sure you understood that he's a, a very lovely guy. Uh, maybe that's just me. I'm, I'm not a close talker, but I love that somebody is very, uh, Somebody can be intimate with you very closely and you understand who they are very, uh, from, from a close angle. And that's, that's, that, that was rare for me to see a kind of person who I can see their heart beating. Um, so this is Abhishek and, and I'll speak a little bit more about this whole project in a second too. But Abhishek, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit too. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Camille. Uh, I think that's a great introduction, thank you you for introducing me as uh, as your friend, I think more than anything else. And uh, and yeah, I, I, I do have to say that I, this was one of the most important friendships for me as well in that time. Uh, I was out of home for the first time in my life, out of the country. And um, it was great to be in that diverse a place and yet to have a bearing in friends like Camille, with whom I think we started in a way thinking about the theater outside of the tradition, quote unquote, whatever we had. Uh, so I'm excited to be here and also excited to be here, thanks to Jehan and uh, Drama School, uh, which were all ideas that, uh, you know, I remember talking to Jehan about Drama School and him, him talking to me about it before this started in Adi Shakti in Pondicherry, and we were talking about what might happen. Uh, so that's really exciting. And of course, there's Amy, who uh, I have never actually, I realized when I saw Amy's name here, I had never completed a piece in front of Amy ever in my life. Because she, she wouldn't, she, whenever I sat, start performing about, after about two, two and a half minutes, she would say, thank you. And she would stop us. And then she would tell us what we were doing. So I'm hoping for the first time in my life to be able to finish something in front of you, Amy. Uh, but on a serious note, thank you very much for being here. And Madhu, who's also a very old friend. Um, <laughs> and I really look up to her. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Amy. Amy. <laughs> Sorry, what were you saying? No, I was going to say uh, thank you, Amy, for putting that uh, stage fright back in us after all this time, too. <laughs> And uh, we have another person here, Carlos. He, uh, he went to uh, school with us. He went through our first year with us too, Carlos Segarra. So hello, Carlos. So listen, I, 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 the, 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 the topic that I kept pestering um, Jehan about was this particular uh, notion that we've got posted up on the chat. I want to make sure I say it right, so I'm going to read it out loud. Uh, what kind of theater writing is expected of us writers in and beyond this pandemic? What social responsibility do writers bear? In what ways can an imaginative approach to writing for stage transform issues like social change, right? And um, I was much more confident during the middle of this pandemic about everything, right? I thought, okay, what? Well, as soon as this, these ideas I have as a theater artist uh, are able to be implemented during this pandemic, things will kind of sprout out and things will just magically uh, take place. And I've really related to, I've heard Jehan talk very, uh, romantically about what he felt like his school and his theater is able to do. And I'm always kind of right behind him when I hear him speaking um, about what could be, what, what could press through all this pandemic, uh, these pandemic problems that are, that are like, still likely to, uh, to press through our lives and uh, how does theater work in that way. Um, in my mind, um, what I remember about theater is being a very collaborative, imaginative project, right? Very close to the way uh, I had my mother read to me when I was a kid. And so uh, I felt like while she was reading to me, I could read off the page and I would be halfway building the house with her that she was constructing while she read it to me, right? And that's how I always understood uh, theater to work as a verb, right? If it was ever a verb to me, I didn't call it anything. It might've just been a ghost that kind of, uh, I guess, kind of possessed particular, uh, uh, I guess, rituals or behaviors that we got into. And one of those was when my mother told me stories. I, the only way I could participate is when I read along with her in the story. Then I was constructing a house. And so I always felt like theater, unlike TV and film, which kind of seeks a certain verisimilitude, 
was really fabulous for me when I got a chance to actually experience it as a kid, when some actor or actors came out on stage and start speaking to us, creating the world. And then we went with them on a journey in a completely, you know, otherwise completely bare black box theater. And for me, that meant something like belief. Like I had to believe in what they were doing in order to go on that journey with them. And I wonder if, uh, because I've read about some of the things that you've gone through in terms of your producing a play, Abhishek, uh, and you've had these, these, these political tumultuous things happen around you. I wonder if you can talk about the role that belief has in terms of what theater does for an audience, how the audience is working with what they believe in front of them and, how, and what does that mean when you're doing something that's kind of politically fraught? Just curious. Yeah, I mean, I think in the kind of, you know, there are two or three different kinds of things because of working in different languages. Invariably, you know, like when I write for, say, a street theater performance, it's very different from, you know, writing for the Royal Court, let's say, as a, as a spectrum of, do I know who the audience is? I know more or less when I'm in that street theater performance. Do I know at the Royal Court? I don't know. I land up and then one day I figure out, okay, there are these people who come to watch this play. Um, but in terms of belief, I should say there is a particular challenge that I find right now. And I'll stick to, you know, a very specific example. I developed this play for a street theater company in Delhi called Jannat Timans, which is quite a, you know, historic street theater company in Delhi. Their, their work is very political. And uh, the show I did with them was uh, uh, called Tathagat, which, which is another name for the Buddha. And it is a play about caste politics um, and how there is a sculptor who has been commissioned by a king to, in the eighth century to make a sculpture for, for, of the Buddha because it's a Buddhist kingdom um, on the day of his you know, grand coronation. He's going to take over multiple states and become an emperor from Mr. King. And the sculptor ends up making the sculpture which uh, he's been given a lot of white stone to make the sculpture. And instead of using the white stone, he sculpts the Buddha out of the black rock. And the king calls him and he says, you're going to be tried because you're insulting me in front of everyone. And he argues that, well, actually is the Buddha yours or mine? If the Buddha is mine, then why would he be? Why would he, the Buddha be white? The Buddha be, would look like me, which means he would be black. And you know, so it's a it's a play about who does this god belong to? Is it the people or is it this king and how he imagines himself and so on? So on. Now this is often performed, you know, in this has been performed in the farmer struggle earlier in labor. Uh, there was a big march in India, uh, which was done by labor unions. And it's also performed in a lot of localities uh, in a very politically charged atmosphere. Now, during the pandemic, the challenge has been that on one hand, social inequities have been at their peak. You know, they have been exposed uh, remarkably because people haven't had food to eat if they were not you know, employed and they were daily wage employers. Most people who were our audiences for that show were essentially taking the largest hit in cities during the pandemic, which means the, that even politically, they were at the most marginalized place and they needed to have the greatest voice. Uh, but at the same time, the street theater company very simply couldn't go out and perform in large groups because they would be also placing these people who they are, you know, becoming the political voice of, they would be placing them at risk by performing. So it was a continuous catch 22 situation with this play, uh, whether to perform it in its original, with its original intention and how should it be, and how do you social distance in a locality in Delhi, you know, like in a crowded market in Delhi, you cannot really social distance there. It's not, that's not what happens. I mean, we have audiences, you know, I, I've seen shows of this play where there are women standing in houses on 
there's a guy who's climbed a lamp post and there's a man with a chicken in his hand all of them are there to watch this play so there's no question of social distance i think those are some of the challenges that i find familiar of that kind of work i mean not with the i think the proscenium is extremely guarded you know there are there is a unionization if not in india but in other places uh, but you know there is a, there is something like when we say protecting the theater i think there's a lot of focus on protecting these big theaters and these uh, you know uh, the, the the big proscenium stages of the world uh, and i wonder you know what happens to all this other theater which goes and performs amongst the people how does it get protected uh, and uh, you know i i want to ask the question back to you as well like with your practice where do you do you see challenges of uh, performance affecting the political intent of your work and how do you think that can be you know negotiated yeah um i'm always really hesitant to talk uh thank you i mean that's a great question actually i'm always really hesitant to talk about the the uh the american political scene um because how do i say this i'm embarrassed to admit that i as a black american i'm always having to um gaze through a lot of filtered uh, uh understandings of 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 an American as an American citizen. So in other words, somebody says they're helping me because they're interested in black lives. Um, but there's no material advantage in them trying to help me, right? They're just doing something that says they're doing something. And again, I can't tell anymore, right? As a black American, I'm completely confused often by someone saying they have my 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 uh, best interest at heart. I say my being Black Americans, and yet there's no material advantage at all in the, the, the projects or initiatives you engage in, or what ends up being a six to eight month kind of initiative that becomes very complicated. I think Black farmers are going through this where Biden has signed something that says Black farmers should get something. And apparently no Black farmers are getting what they're supposed to be getting because people are complaining, but it's also been set up to look like, ah, white farmers can't get anything. So it's like, what is this for? Is this a game we're playing? So, so when I talk as a Black American, I'm talking as a person who's lost a lot of faith in what I'm seeing in front of me, right? And so as a sensitive person, as an artist, right? When someone lies to me in front of me and we both know they're lying, I don't know what to do with that because that feels like force. That feels like hostility. It feels like somebody's punching me in my face. So, and um, I mentioned in other unrehearsed futures that I've lost a couple of friends through this pandemic, but it was bound to happen because I'm now negotiating their friendship through a Zoom. And um, these are people who, you know, because of traumas, it's always because of traumas, right? But these are people who, uh, who, who may not be able to face multiple lies. And this is what I think is happening in society, at least in my society right now, which is that sometimes when you're caught, you say anything. But once you say anything, you set something in motion, you free up a, a, a demon, right? And now you've got multiple demons being uh, let loose every time you say something because you're lying, right? And now you can't catch all of those demons. They're just flying around the room. And so the political experience of a Black American typically is to just go along with whatever the left is doing or saying, because it's too far too complicated to understand it through all these other filters. We have somebody who's, and I won't say their name, but who's the second in command, who's done, uh, who's done a pretty good job of locking up people who look like her. And so, again, I don't know what that means. This is a person who was so unpopular that Andrew Yang hold better than her and yet she was chosen as a second in command to this country. So I don't know what all this means, except that I as a black American needs to, need to tread very lightly and figure out how to abstract what I do and say so that it seems as harmless as possible, even to the point of just removing myself from authorial kind of, uh, of a presence in terms of the writing, just because I don't know what my face really means to people other than an opportunity to take advantage of it because I'm black, right? And again, I'm speaking very honestly about what I see as my colleagues, people my age, people younger than me being absolutely taken advantage of. I feel when I see all this Black Lives Matter, I see black people being exoticized 
and, and, it, and it disturbs me because it wasn't like this only five years ago. It wasn't like this every 10 years ago. And I don't see material advantages happening as a result. So this is why it concerns me. And this is why I brought, brought all this up in the first place is because I'm not sure if everybody's having the same political kind of disadvantages that I'm having in terms of being able to trust anything that anybody's saying to me anymore, especially with a face like me, <laughs> you know? And so it, it becomes a concern because my mother, when I was a kid, the mother would I had was that I could trust most black people that I ran into because we were navigating some sort of underground, even in the 1970s. I don't know if I have that same feeling anymore. So it's, it's put me into some sort of, you know, I'm 48 years old, so I'm not a boomer. Uh, I'm not a millennial. I'm in this other world where I've seen both worlds, right? Where it was much more a clear cast system. And now we're pretending like there's not. And it's, it's just bizarre. So anyway, I say all that to kind of almost give up the ghost back to you, <laughs> Abhishek. And, and I hope somebody else can actually say, speak a little bit about this. Even if you're not African-American, you can relate a little bit. You don't have to be African-American. You don't have to actually not. <laughs> it's just something I've been, it's been a concern of mine. What, so the, the biggest concern for me now is just what do we, because even just you're talking about being able to do something try, while social distancing, dealing with all these factors within the context of trying to do this performance with a belief systems that you're kind of pushing up against. What are we as artists to do? And you've had situations that are life and death. How, are we artists picking up bricks and sticks and stones? What do we do with forces that don't feel so malevolent, but they don't feel benevolent? What do we do with forces that don't feel so aggressive, but they sure as hell don't feel unhostile? They're just maybe passive aggressive. And as artists, is that our, is that our responsibility? So that can be open to you, Abhishek, right now, but I'm just curious about it. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing what you did, Camille. You know, first, I just want to say that a year ago, I started being very interested in the relationship between Ambedkar and Debui. Because when we speak of Ambedkar, we often speak of you know, Ambedkar being the most probably important um, leader of the anti-caste movement in India and so on and so forth. Um, generally known as the person who, who was the founder or the father of the constitution of the country. But I think he's also had a much larger role to play in terms of caste politics in India and not just this one constitution. But what is very interesting is that Ambedkar had a very, uh, when he went to Colombia, I think early 1900s, uh, it was the time when segregation was being taken away in New York. And there were still areas which were segregated. And the impact that that had on his own thinking, especially his reading of the buoy, Ambedkar's own um, writing in Colombia at that time uh, has a lot of um, footnotes and, and you know on the sides, which are all him kind of working through caste oppression, but learning in a way what to do through the work of Debuy and through what the black movement was shaping up to be at that point. And I find that really interesting because it's such an early example of genuine international solidarity uh, because it's not surface solidarity. It, it, there's no, I don't think there's any, from whatever I have read of Ambedkar, uh, there is no general sense of, you know, that is an oppression and this is an oppression, so it's the same. He, he doesn't equate it like that. In fact, he finds much deeper connections and things that are uh, similar and things that are separate. Uh, they, they, the Dalit Panthers movement in India is sort of named after uh, the Black Panthers movement in, in, in America. Uh, there are so many, uh, you know, like Martin Luther came to India and it was, it's very interesting because uh, what is his relationship to Gandhi uh, on one hand is, you know, to learn nonviolence, but on the other hand, uh, Ambedkar is Gandhi's, one of Gandhi's greatest opponents. And Ambedkar is kind of criticizing Gandhi for his policies and saying that this is a very upper caste Hindu Brahminical idea that everybody has to be, you know, non, non, everybody has to be vegetarian and, you know, everybody should follow this 
but violence is not just hitting people. What you are doing to us as upper caste Indians is violence for years. So where do you place a Martin Luther there who has resonances, who himself learns from Gandhi, but who also learns from Mbedkar? So I'm just saying that I think that is a very interesting period to study that I've found in this, in this time, uh, because it really complicates the notion of what is international solidarity. What does it mean to, you know, find from another place uh, the tools to be able to address your own uh, your own iniquities, and how do we go beyond sort of very narrow, I would say, you know, identities which are not historically defined, but identities which are defined post the rise of capitalism, because this kind of very watertight identity politics is very useful for you know the spread of a certain way of thinking um, and there are resonances of this in 1920s which it is which i just find fascinating that you know uh, you are you're talking about uh, something that that was there even at that time uh, as far as my relationship to you know aggression is concerned look unfortunately i was brought up in delhi uh, delhi is a great place but it also prepared me for, uh, Delhi is also a very aggressive place. You know? So this sort of aggression doesn't bother me ever. You know? I've had two or three death threats in the last 12 years, but you know, guys who give death threats are even right now sitting around the corner from my house maybe, you know, they're just some guys who sit around and bum around and then they very easily give, uh, you know, death threats and things like that. So that's not the problem. I think that the real challenge, and that's something I'm, I'm up for, like I, wanted to be a writer uh, because of, you know, Sadhgar Hashmi, who was at Jannati and, and Lorca and, you know, all these, my, all my heroes were people who stood up for things. I don't know if I am as courageous as them or if I'm as relevant as them, or if I would ever be able to write something even close to what they've written. I'm not sure that only time will tell, but they are definitely my heroes. So death threats and bans and censorship this doesn't it has an impact on the family for sure sometimes you know like you go back home and then nobody is watching you you realize that it has had an impact you know you're at your home like one morning i remember my wife and i Pallavi and i we were sitting and discussing whether we should send my daughter to school or not because in the papers it said that my play has been banned and it's a you know there is the thing of, you know, it's a national, it was in the national news and the current mood in India is such that it can blow up so easily. You don't know whether you should send your child to school, who's, who's going to kindergarten at that time. So the effects that a, a, a writer's politics can have on his or her family is enormous. You know, I think that's been a real, one of the concerns. Um, but personally, otherwise, no, I don't think so. What has been very interesting for me is while working abroad, uh, I, I think I've been able to spot the real, uh, the really damaging racism versus the kind of easy racism. Like easy racism is somebody saying, you know, oh, you know, I remember this British academic once said, international theater started with uh, the first ship which went from England to Indonesia. And that is where I said, you know, but that's really strange that everything in this world starts with the first ship that leaves England. Uh, and to assume that that is what internationalism is, is kind of bizarre. Uh, but that's easy, that's easy to pick, you know, that, that sort of racism. What is hard to pick is sometimes what happens is you, you realize after two or three years in a, in, in a certain kind of relationship that, you know, this person is not hearing you and they don't want you to argue. Like their notion of an Indian is somebody who doesn't argue, is somebody who's spiritual and who hasn't, you know, who's kind of a little bit in the hills all the time and who, who always checks in with themselves and some kind of, you know, 1800 year old God to come up with, you know, and this is like full of wisdom and, but this is not, obviously, this is a huge generalization. Uh, and there is a problem in many international curations when you start arguing. Uh, I suppose that's the kind of racism that is hard to unpick, you know, because 
that's 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 the racism of the benevolent which is infinitely more damaging than the racism of the person who's clearly racist i mean i love those races that kind of racism which is open uh, and not this other type uh, yeah i suppose that's what I, i you know is my i'm riffing off of what you're saying you know when you're talking about race and color no you said, you said a lot man i mean i and i first of all i want to appreciate the fact that uh you kind of defanging these uh these people these individuals who make death threats um i think it's important for us to hear that from someone who's actually faced death threats that you know they're just guys are hanging on the corner these are they're actually people right you can actually define who these people are and so on some level i mean i hear people talk about jeff bezos and these kind of he's almost a trillionaire he'll be a trillionaire soon in a couple of years and you know the fact that he's flying over our heads and everything and i think it's important to recognize who these people are right they're just because they they have these huge monstrous mechan mecca kind of existences around them that they're still individuals with uh i i guess maybe just predispositions and maybe even flaws and fallibilities that allow them to be a part of some sort of you know in human mecca in some ways too so uh, i mean i think maybe that's where speaking uh, with with jehan is actually writing in the chat is that where do where do our creative impulses take us uh then when we when we're dealing with i mean again i love the idea of saying those people who have power those that person behind that tank who has the ability to press a button and explode my life and turn it into to, uh, and turn my life and the life of my family and everything to, to have these enormous consequences i wonder if there's something about that that i can make fun of first of all i don't you know again as an african american and as an american you're taught that first and foremost you protect yourself right and um and, and my brother and i talk about this a lot too when when we're, when we're talking about um our experience with people who are immigrating into this country or immigrate who have immigrated into this country they're sending money back all the time and always concerned about your family not just their family back home and my brother and i always talked about it when we were younger as boring right <laughs> you know because we're so used to having this experience of being these kids who have these individual lives even if you don't have no money as an american you tend to think very selfishly about some things and um and, and i wonder if for 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 here part of the revolution is is just to present fables or morals where we actually put ourselves into some sort of contention around what we want versus what other people need and want around us right and i think we as a, as an american i can only safely say that i see those morals needing to be retaught to us in certain ways whether you you color it or texturize it or put a different kind of spin on the story i think the story still needs to be that we as america for whatever reason we take pride in having this lens of focus just on us I'm meeting mm -hmm. sorry jam did you or were you saying something okay sorry no no worries but yeah, that, that's that's one of the approaches i'm 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 concerned about is just how do i then articulate that do i is it a matter of going into you know i i i talk with a, one of my colleagues about like figuring out levels of abstraction right am i going to talk about covid <laughs> whenever we're able to get back into a theater space uh am i going to talk about it as a direct correlation to what has happened in my 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 locality am i going to abstract it in some way so that you know we're talking about covid but there's something kind of a little bit tingly about the fact that we're putting a parallel uh experiences together really close by or am i going to abstract it to the point of we're just talking about large shapes and sounds and it's going to be like children's theater what's healthy what's helpful for an audience right now is a question um um that i have i have uh for artists in the future and i'll be sure you can you can take that but i'd be curious about anybody jayhan or anybody else whoever's whoever is interested in that answer to that question how abstract do we do we get and how close to the bone do we want to get in order to be able to make sure that everybody's getting the point of our story i've got um if i can just jump in with a couple of uh queries um i've got this sort of question which is really about um mm, this bear with me for a second if one is i mean camille i got a real sense from you that that 
there's a sense of being unmoored recently uh, and unhinged with what, what, you know, what's not unhinged, but unmoored and, and therefore, you know, not knowing how to respond next. And that's why this topic has been so uh, uh, close to you. Abhishek, I, I don't necessarily get that feeling from you because I feel like uh, a lot of the experiences you've had uh, is constantly in a state of change, flux, uh, danger, this, that, the other. Um, but at the same time, and you said that, you know, the pandemic is not really, uh, I've got a lot of things going on in terms of notions I want to explore, et cetera. But this moment or this moment that we've all experienced going through, I'm just trying to figure out where it's, you know, what is it bringing to the fore in terms of potential uh, interventions and impulses going forward as writers in terms of who do you write for, what do you write, um, how, do you, how do you write about it? Uh, abstract cutting to the bone or not seems to be one, one fork, but then which fork do you take and why, as Kabili said. So that's one. Um, and I just want to know, like, maybe if you think about projects you're thinking about or ideas you've been thinking about going forward, you know, not just the commissions that have been postponed indefinitely, but literally, like, if you had to sit down and think about something you want to do right now, what, what, what is coming to mind? And that's one big question. Um, the second one is also this question when you describe the Jannatya Manch uh, situation and, you know, whether they can do that play. Uh, uh, we went down to Mumbai Marathi Satya Sang where the drama school Mumbai exists after nine months to just check out, you know, is everything okay, etc. And the lady I met there, vaccinations are now happening all over the, all over the place and all. And she was just like, you guys are worrying about this way too much. I was like, you haven't gotten vaccinated? She's like, no, I mean, I'll get around to it. But I mean, you guys are worrying about it way too much. We're all fine over here. We've been fine the whole time. We've, you know, we've worn our masks. We're drinking a, a, hot, uh, a hot decoction every night called kara. Uh, which is made of you know turmeric and peppercorn and uh, other kinds of things and we're good uh, you've made too much of this you privileged people and i just imagine that moment where you also you come into that space and you're worrying about how to con conduct a street theater play responsibly with social distancing norms etc but when i'm walking through the gully on any given day there is no social distancing they're all managing somehow cheek by jowl because they can't afford social distancing so suddenly when we come out to perform with that that it's a privileged responsibility maybe, or it's a responsibility that comes from, I don't know. And, and I'm just thinking then, then who's writing like this act of creative authorship, where, uh, what would happen? Like who needs to tell the stories and, and, and what, because the other thing I'm questing about, sorry, this is the, this is the distraction, but the other, this is the final thing is, is there a way that they can, be given the tools to tell their stories or are we missing a point because i just felt like i completely missed the point when i walked into that room and um uh, shanta devi was saying to me you know you guys are making too much of this and and we just i felt like an idiot for like not not running a drama school all this time <laughs> um in the pandemic and just i feel like i'm missing a perspective because of who i am and where i am so two things, one is that, so there are really two questions, very separate, but I use the first one to just say, where are your creative impulses lying? What are you thinking about right now? And the second question is, is really about, have we missed the point because of where we're speaking from? Abhishek, you wanna, you wanna try and? See, I'll tell you, Jahan, with the say, let me go for the second one first. My yeah. experience is slightly different from yours in that case. <clears throat> uh, because all the places that we performed in, uh, many of those kind of places where we were performing were also places where I was regularly in for relief work. Then I'm part of these schools that you know, which, which are running in, uh, which have been going on for 12 or 13 years now. So in my case, at least, it wasn't something that was outside of my community. It was very much a part of a community where either I'm at night school from like 11 at night to four in the morning anyway, or if I'm not at night school, then we are involved in, you know, some other, during the pandemics, particularly with ration and, you know, the food supply and then later on oxygen and this and that. And the one thing that I learned very much during the pandemic 
is that information had to be uh, made available from anyone who had more information to anyone who had less information. So there were a lot of things that I was learning about uh, social distancing from the mall view of the mosque who runs the free school. You know, now on the surface, one would think that, oh, you know, this is, would be a very crowded place and so on and so forth. But he was trying to tell people who are part of that locality, whose children come to our school, that look, we need to make sure that the children are able to write some of these exams that they were writing. And at the same time, they are socially distanced, right? And the method, some of the methods that they came up with for those uh, were things I was learning from him because he was there all the time, right? Uh, so actually, I don't think the, uh, the difference, the demarcation was so much in terms of, you know, we and us was not, at least from my experience that, you know, people who, uh, who live in this particular area or people who don't, but it was really even within the community, there was a lot of, there is a lot of disparity about who says I will go back to my village and I will not live in the city anymore because in the village there is no coronavirus versus who says that, no, I'm going to sit here and wear double masks so that I can continue to work because I have to repay the loan that I've taken in my village. Like There are a lot of differences. And I just want to say that sometimes I think uh, our imagined, not, not in your case, I mean, you had this real experience, but I'm saying sometimes our imagined sense of who we are and who they are is very different from actually what it is once, you know, once you're in the community and you're working in a community. It's, it's really, uh, you know, uh, a different ball game. So I didn't quite feel that was the case. I think politically, people who are setting up markets in Bangalore, for example, are so scared. You know, just one month ago, we had so many deaths due to COVID. Everybody knows at least three people who have died, every single person. And when they have opened up shops, it is because they, they do not want to starve. That's why they've opened up the shop. It's not because they don't believe in, in this. And somehow I think our popular media has created this myth, you know, that uh, because people don't believe in coronavirus, that's why India had very large numbers. But of course, that's, that's I mean, they didn't have anywhere to go. How would they get home? What, what would happen to them? I think there's part, part of it is that. Um, yeah, let me stop there. Let me pass the first question, actually, or maybe even the second question to Camille and see what he, what he has to say. Yeah, I, I'll just follow on with... Um... One of the, 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 the questions uh, originally um, put to Abhishek, which is, uh, you know, around, around the idea of belief, which is, um, I, I mean, again, for me, theater had a lot of competition growing up. And again, speaking at a particular time, it was just wasn't accessible. It was a little bit too expensive, even though we had the, the oldest Black American theater in the country at the time, in Freedom Theater in Philadelphia. It just wasn't, it, it was It was until August Wilson came along, it wasn't necessarily always doing anything but commemorating past experiences of Black drama. And so we would have a, a show that would start and it would be called Black whatever, and it would be some sort of form of the, the Jesus story, the Christmas story or whatever. And so it wasn't really speaking to me as a kid. So trying to find some way of, you know, having an artistic life, so to speak, was through video games, comic books, TV and film. And those were very accessible, right? They weren't $35 or $20 a pop. So for me, what I think might be possible within theater is not necessarily that you just stage things in a space or even over a crowded space or a protracted time period. I think theater ought to be as cagey and as fun as uh, what um, advertisers do, right? They put a lot of hidden messages and things. They're trying to be cute, but what they do is then turn your mind, it's like lying, right? It's setting off demons outside of things you can control. So you end up finding yourself as a kid repeating behaviors that you've seen in a commercial that no human being does to another human being. And what I'm saying is that we can turn the tables <laughs> in terms of theater 
by just uh, uh, enabling our audience to be as smart as us. So that when we put out advertisements that look like advertisements you might see, I don't even know if you get anything through snail mail anymore, but email certainly. And there's sort of a wink around this being something that you and I know is gonna be a production of some sort. It might be a way of being able to sneak theater into just the promotion of theater, right? You're actually telling story, you're promoting a world, but you're not necessarily doing it in one staged event. And I'm sure everybody's kind of practiced this in their own kind of ways of presenting theater to other people. But I'm not even talking about necessarily even having a staging ground. I'm talking about just entertaining people in ways that make them feel like they're part of the, like I said, with children's theater, right? You feel like you're a part of it because on some level, you have to imagine so much, you know, and um, I think that may be available to us, right? We've got acrobats, we've got clowns, we've got comedians, we've got strippers, we've got all these things that are part of theater that we never take advantage of. And if you put them into play in a realistic way, I say realistic, meaning that they're a part of life, you know, and that they wink at us occasionally as audience members and they wink at us occasionally when we're participants, it might, uh, say it might be a really interesting way of being able to bring children's theater into our real world and I think a really constructive way. That's my idea. And however I'm doing it, I won't even get into the details of it because we can all imagine what we're talk what I'm talking about. It's not too hard. It's just a question of um, whether you're going to get paid for it and whether you're going to get any authorial uh, credit for it. And that's another thing, right? So I'm going to take this moment to just say that, um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of material put out of varying natures. Um, we're going to stop the recording, but continue to have a conversation and chat. Um, so do feel free to raise your hand, use the raise hand feature, or just put your hand up. And I think I have an eye of everybody who's on video. And uh, we'll, we'll continue the, the conversation. So. Uh,